So, welcome. Today we're going to learn how to draw and shade geometric solids. And we're going to start with the most elementary solid, which is the sphere. So, begin by attempting to draw a circle. Um, if you have a hard time drawing a circle, uh, I must say I did a pretty good job with that. Like I can't even see where I can't even see where my line started that time. That was pretty good. Um, but if can we please have quiet in here so you can hear what I'm saying? Um, if you're having a hard time drawing a circle. Uh, think about it like this. Your first try is going to be lumpy and like that. Just do it very lightly. Okay, there's my focus. Um, let me lock focus so that doesn't happen again. Excuse me. Um, So your first try drawing a circle isn't going to be perfect. You want to look for dents. See, there's a dent. Fill in the dents and take away the lumps. So if you, even if you draw a bad circle, if you make a few adjustments, you could turn it into a good circle. Okay. Make sure it's at least as big as your fist. Don't make it really tiny. And So next thing we're going to do is think about where the light's coming from. And let's have the light coming this direction. So I'm going to draw the angle of the light represented by a line there and there. Now if the light is up here, shining this way, that means that this side of the ball is going to be in light and this side is going to be in shadow. However, what we do not know is um, how the, what kind of line we're going to have here. So basically what's happening is the light is shining this way. Let me move this so it's the same size as what I'm drawing. So if the light is in front of the ball, like on our side of the ball, we could end up with a shadow line like this. And if the light is behind the ball, if it's backlit, we could end up with a shadow line like this. Or if the light is in the same plane as the ball, we could end up with a shadow line like this. What we can't have is a shadow line like this or like this because that's not consistent with this light source. Do you, see what it, do you see what I mean? Okay, so let's start by just making a straight line very lightly going across. That's what would happen if the light was in the same plane as the ball. Um, but now let's assume that the light is a little bit closer to us, which is typical. Then what we're going to have is 
and uh, we're going to have to build an ellipse around this line. And for the first one, I want you to draw the entire ellipse because you know how to draw ellipses. And then we're going to erase the back half of it. So this is a typical shadow edge that you'd find on a sphere. These lines are called tangents to the circle on our page. This is a diameter of the sphere. And this is half an ellipse. Now, assuming we're looking down on this sphere, we can imagine that it is touching the ground right about here, right? Are we agreed on that? This is about where it's touching the ground. And because the light, because we made this curve down, we're implying that the light is in front of the ball slightly. That means the shadow is going to be moving back away from us. So we're going to make a line that goes slightly upward as it goes back. You can't see what? Is that better? And now we're going to build an ellipse around this line like this. And what we just created is a believable shadow on the ground um, that's based on that light source. This is called a shadow map. Before we do any shading, we try to establish where the light falls and where it doesn't. And shadow mapping is only possible when you have a limited supply of light sources. Um, for example, this ball in my hand would be impossible to shadow map because uh, the light is coming from about 10 different places. There's all these lights all over the ceiling and there's light coming in from the window. So you can't shadow map this. Um, what you can shadow map is something that has a single light source like this. Um, you're already familiar with the concept of construction lines. These are lines that no longer have to be part of our drawing. So we're going to erase these and erase this. And all we have left now is the shadow map itself. And the next step is going to be to do what's called the first shading. And the direction you do the first shading is going to vary depending on what hand you're shading with. Um, most of you are right-handed, and you're going to do your first shading in this direction. You don't need to start yet. Um, if you are left-handed, you're going to do your first shading in this direction. Um, are most of you right-handed? Yeah. Chances are that you're mostly right-handed. So. Uh, so if you're left-handed, you're going to do it the other direction. Um, there's a reason for this that I'm going to explain in a minute. But for now, everyone just do a first shading over the entire shadow map. And notice that internal boundaries of the shadow map, like this line, are not boundaries that we need to stop at when we do first shading. We just shade right across that. We're treating this all as one big shape of shadow. Um, 
Um, if you're left-handed, you slope this way. It's just the direction of the slant is reversed. Now there's a reason for that, which I'll explain as I'm doing this. Um, notice that if you're shading in this direction and you're right-handed, if you put your opposite hand on your shoulder while you're working, you're going to feel your shoulder move. You're using your entire arm to shade if you shade the proper direction for you. And if you're shading the wrong direction for you, like this, you put your hand on your shoulder, you're not going to feel anything. If you're shading this way and you're right-handed, you're only using the muscles of your forearm and wrist. You're not using your whole arm and your whole body. So what we're trying to get to is shading with your whole arm and your whole body, not just your hand. Now, most of the drawings that you've ever done have been really small. So this isn't really an issue for you because if you're doing a tiny little drawing, you can shade the wrong way and not really notice. But if you start drawing bigger and you start drawing in an easel, um, it's really important that you get into a groove of shading mostly in a way that's allowing your whole arm to move. And you'll find that you can make much longer strokes going this way and much more accurate strokes than you can shading the shading the wrong way. Um, I am, as I said, I'm left-handed. I'm doing all the shading with my right hand, but um, I'm able to do it pretty well just because this movement is so natural and easy. Um, you should all be able to arrive at something this accurate since you're drawing with the hand that you're comfortable with and I'm not. And notice that we do not want it to look like, we want to be able to read the shading direction, but we don't want it to look like zebra stripes. So wherever you see the stripes showing, you just lightly go over them a few more times over that area until it looks more like a solid tone. This is not a technique that people do naturally. It's only you only learn to draw this way if someone teaches you and you practice it. Um, it's sort of like correct fingering of on a piano keyboard or uh, guitar neck. It's not like a natural thing to do, so don't feel concerned if it feels a little awkward right now. Um, it will feel natural after a while. So after this is all shaded in, we're going to anticipate, we're going to get rid of lines we don't need. We don't need these light lines anymore. And we can anticipate that this, this edge here is going to have to be softer. So we're going to erase the boundary here, just the line itself, that we the map. And we're going to lightly erase the map around here too. And if you squint and look at this, it should look like a ball sitting on a shadow. Now we could do an entire drawing using just this hand direction. The problem is um, all of our edges would be about the same amount of sharpness. And uh, what we're aiming for is edges that vary in sharpness. So as we make things darker, we're going to think about shading direction that allows us to 
sharpen some edges and soften other edges. So like this here, this edge should be sharper, right? And this should be darker here. So we're going to shade with the edge and sharpen that edge. Everyone try to do exactly what I'm doing now. It doesn't matter if you're left-handed or right-handed. Whereas this edge here should be soft because it's a curved form. So we're going to shade right over that edge and gradually fade out as our line goes into the light. Notice I am not just grinding the pencil back and forth uh, like this. Okay, I'm putting the pencil down in the dark area and releasing it into the light area and that gives me a nice fade from dark to light. You can't get that effect if you go back and forth with your pencil. You see the difference? So we're just going like that and it gets very easy after a while and I'm going to fade as I go the other way down into the down into that area. And notice also, let's hop over here for a second. When we sharpen this edge, we're going to need to curve our lines the other way, like this. So, in order to get from lines that curve this way to lines that curve this way, what we're going to have to create in the middle are lines that are pretty much straight. You see that? And then they're going to start curving the other way until they get to here and now they're curving pretty strongly the other direction. And this should remind you of the latitude and longitude lines on the globe. They curve with the form and a way to always achieve this effect is to as you're drawing, sort of imagine that you're touching the form. Imagine that it's a solid thing and your lines are curving with the form because they are wrapping around the form as you draw. And again, every stroke I make is trailing off into the light, starting in the dark and trailing off into the light like that. And the more of these curved lines I make, the more dark I'm creating and also the more of a solid kind of three-dimensional effect I'm creating. Now notice I'm not darkening right down here. There's a reason for that. It's because right in here, there's going to be light bouncing up from the table onto the bottom of the ball. That's called reflected light. And we're going to just leave that area alone for now and not touch it. Because you can't make anything look round unless you acknowledge the reflected light hitting the bottom, bottom side of the surface. This doesn't look bright enough yet though because I didn't darken this yet. So what I'm going to do now is darken on the ground and I'm switching to mostly horizontal strokes because this is a horizontal surface. So I'm going to put my pencil down really firmly along this boundary and shade out from it like this and notice that when I get to the end here I don't want it to be a really sharp edge I want it to be slightly fuzzy so I'm gonna let these lines also just trail out slightly over my boundary as I darken this
And notice also, I need this to be sharper. So I'm going to do a few strokes right in here that follow, follow the edge. Anytime you want to sharpen an edge, you have to basically outline the form. But in order, to, so you don't want it to look like an outline. So after you do a few lines that follow the form like that, you sort of transition out from them and See, I'm doing a few that follow the edge and then transitioning into these horizontal lines. So it doesn't look outlined. It looks like a nice sharp edge that's sort of bleeding off into a softer edge as it moves out. OK, the last thing we're going to try to account for in this drawing is the highlight. Um, there should be where the, the part of the ball that faces the light should be a little brighter than the rest of the light. Um, it's going to be right up in here. Um, so in order to bring that out, what I'm going to do is I'm going to shade the light side of the ball with a very, very light pressure. Now you can probably not even see what I'm doing here. You do not want to shade the anything in the light with anywhere near the same amount of pressure that you shade things that are in the shadow. So I'm going to just barely touch that. I'm using my first shading direction again and then I'm going to erase my highlight. Um, if you can't see that, don't worry about it. Just it's better, they, it's better not even to touch the light side than to make it too dark because you want all this to be, to really stand out. So when you squint your eyes, what you see is a strong difference between shadow and light. Um, we're going to now do one more quick drawing um, along the same lines of a cylinder. And we're going to start with an ellipse at the top. Um, you've done cylinders before, so this shouldn't be too hard. Now you're going to do verticals. You can do this on the same piece of paper. And we're going to do a fatter ellipse at the bottom. Now why is that ellipse going to be fatter than the top one? Anybody? Because it is what? It's less... Yeah, it's less foreshortened. The answer is always foreshortened, so just <laughs> remember that. Um, here's my seltzer can. Notice that if I turn it the same way, the top is more foreshortened than the bottom, so this ellipse is skinnier than the one that's implied by the bottom. You see, if I get this ellipse to go away completely, up here, this one is still curved on the bottom. Um, most beginners do the opposite thing. That's why their cylinders look so bad. Most people think, oh, the top of my cylinder is a circle, so I'm going to make it round. And the sides are straight. And it's sitting flat on the ground, so I'm going to make the bottom flat. And that doesn't look very good, does it? No. So what you have to remember is the top is foreshortened. The bottom is less foreshortened. So it's two different kinds of ellipses. If you drew a 
cylinder on your one point grid, you already did this and you already proved this to yourself, right? Um, if you did cylinders in isometric, the two ellipses were the same, but that's because isometric is not real life, right? And we, we've established that. So let's imagine this is in the same kind of light as the last drawing we did. So we're just going to need one light line. And let's imagine that the light is coming from slightly in front of the cylinder. So our cast shadow on the ground, these are called cast shadows because they're cast or thrown onto the ground from the, um, from the light source, from, from the object that's, that's blocking the light. It's going gonna, it's gonna to go this way. And the end of this shadow is going to be actually another ellipse. So we're going to end up with a form like that. And if we're trying to figure out how to, where to put the form shadow, which is where the light stops on the form, it's really easy because wherever this line intersects this ellipse here is where the light stops. So we're going to go straight up and that's going to be our entire form shadow. It's not curved this time because the sides of the object are vertical. Then we're going to erase our construction lines again, including the light lines. And we're going to do first shading again. And I'm going to do it left-handed this time. So please, if you're left-handed, follow me. And if you're right-handed, you're going to go the other direction. So this is how lefties shade. Notice I have a much easier time doing it left-handed than I did right-handed. And remember, we are not stopping along this internal boundary within the shadow map. Next, we are erasing the shadow map here and here. Final step is more curved lines for second shading. So these lines are going to curve to follow this edge up here. And they're going to get slightly more curved as they work their way down. You see that? This takes some practice, okay? Again, this is not a natural thing for anyone to do. Now I'm going to soften this edge some more by trailing out past it. What would you expect would have more uh, reflected light, a cylinder or a sphere? Why is that, Van? Because it's like got more points. It's got no points, so you can reflect on all faces. Um, reflect light's coming from the ground. 
So what does a sphere have that a cylinder doesn't have? Uh, does the cylinder have any surfaces that face the ground? No. No. Does the sphere? Yeah. Yeah, that's the difference, okay? Reflected light strikes surfaces that face the ground, and this cylinder doesn't have any faces that face the ground. So you're not going to see much reflected light on this. So you can see why ellipses are so important. Basically, with these shading lines, every line represents a quarter of an ellipse, right? So in order to shade any rounded form, you need to have a very secure grasp on how to draw ellipses. Um, should this edge over here be sharp, where I'm pointing? Yeah, it should because it's a hard overlap. So in order to sharpen this edge, we're going to do some sharpening strokes, which goes straight up and down like that. And we're transitioning into these curved strokes until we can't really see where one type of stroke ends and the other begins. And on the ground, we are going to go, again, horizontal strokes like this. and a little bit of sharpening right here. And since the top of the cylinder is probably a little brighter than the sides, we can do just a very light, very light shading on the lit side of the, of the cylinder. Again, try not to compete with the darkness of the shadow that we established for the shadow side. And that's pretty much the finished drawing of the cylinder. Um, I'm going to give you a little time to finish these drawings. Let me put them both on the screen while I come around and have a look at your work. Let's see if I can fit them both. There you go. And if you're working at home, just pause the video right here. Um, so I was never actually taught this thing about fur shading. Um, it's just something I started noticing was that uh, in the artists that I really loved from the Renaissance, um, you would tend to see a continuity of shading direction. Um, for example, this is a typical drawing by Raphael. Here's another one. Um, let's see. That one's not quite as clear. This one's very clear. Um,
this one's very clear. Um, so w was Raphael left-handed or right-handed? Right-handed, exactly. Um, does everyone appreciate that fact based on these drawings? You see how there's, the lines are sloping over here? And if we look at Leonardo da Vinci, Um, is he right-handed or left-handed? Left-handed, right. You see how how easy it is to tell? There's there's always one basic direction that the lines slant. And you see how clear that is? So obviously left-handed. And that that's really what gave me the idea that I had to start slanting my lines with some kind of uniformity. Um, the reason that you don't always notice it is because um, a lot of hatching technique comes out of the world of printmaking and when you're engraving, especially the world of engraving, when you're engraving you have to cut your lines into a piece of metal and engravers would rotate the metal they were engraving on as they shaded so um, you can't tell what hand direction they were using but if you're working on an easel you should always be able to tell what hand direction the artist used um, okay I'm gonna stop this recording now thank you